Hello there, and I hope you're enjoying your visits here to the National Trust's Vine Estate in North Hampshire today, a place that in previous centuries has seen visits by King Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth I, Sir Walter Raleigh and Jane Austen to name but a few. But today in the 21st century is home to an exhibition which asks the question, is this the ring that inspired author J.R.R. Tolkien? Whatever answer your visit here today has led you to, it's got me to thinking, what is it that inspires an author generally, and Tolkien in particular? And in the hope of answering that question, I'm heading off in the author's footsteps right now. Although, if any of these rings were related to the ones of myth and legend, you'd expect them to have the same magical properties, wouldn't you? My first stop on the Tolkien Trail has brought me somewhere to find out about the author to be's early life. And where better than just a stone's throw away from his first British home here on the outskirts of Birmingham at Sare Hole Mill. John Ronald Rule Tolkien CBE was born in South Africa in 1892 and became an author best known for his classic fantasy works The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion. Wayne Dixon from Sare Hole Mill takes up his story. The Tolkien family would have arrived from South Africa in 1895. Um, his mother got a, uh, got a house here at Sarehole, which was number 5 Gracewells, uh, which is now 226 for White Green Road. When they moved in the new year in 1896, I believe it was, uh, Tolkien um, would have been four years of age. And what he would have known from the area would have been the little rivers, the streams, the woods, and at the heart of it, the mill. And in the foreword of the Lord of the Rings, uh, Tolkien mentions the, the old mill. Um, and it was around that time here that he starts to get his first ideas of um, of language. Uh, a couple of favourite haunts would have been um, not only the mill pond where Tolkien would have uh, learnt to, to climb, climb a tree, and one in particular. Um, he was very sad when it was cut down. It was a, a willow tree that's hung by the pool and one day he, um, he came, to, came to see it. It had been, been hacked down and left and it later that story filters in um, into the latter chapters of The Lord of the Rings with the scouring of the Shire and the party tree in Hobbiton where the hobbits gather, uh, the party tree has been, has been pulled down and left to, to rot on the side of the road and it's by Tolkien's own admission uh, that entire chapter seems to have come from, from what happened to, to places around that he would have liked. And in 1900 Tolkien was able to, to get a scholarship for King Edward's school in New Street which meant that he was just too far away to walk uh, there and back so his mother had to take the decision to move them closer. And what influences did the boys find here at Sarehole Mill and indeed in the surrounding area too? We know more about from his words that um, we have his letters that he's left saying that um, how much Sarehole meant to him um, and, and statements that um, the hobbits, um, the, the race of people who inhabit the, the fictional shire were in part based on people he met around uh, the small Worcestershire village. Um, but at Edgebaston it gets a little more difficult. We only know that the two things that was on Waterworks Road and, and near to Stirling Road at um, Edgebaston would have been uh, the two towers, which is commonly thought of that uh, those were in part an inspiration for, uh, for the towers that frequent Tolkien's, Tolkien's works. So you have the towers of uh, Orthanc, Barad-dur, uh, Minas Tirith, which we're not certain, but we've seen that he would have had to pass them every day from school, um, and they do look very much like you could have a wizard trapped on top of them. Um, he's his time in Birmingham it was cut short really in, um, in the, the 1910s when he, he did get a place to study, uh, study classics at, at Oxford. We know he was back in Birmingham um, in 1917 at the university. It was then he would have moved uh, up north uh, to take up a position at Leeds University. Then in his later life, particularly his middle age, uh, when he had a successful, uh, successful family and his, his family was reared would have been in Oxfordshire. Sounds like I need to investigate the next chapter. Wayne, thank you very much indeed. My thanks to Wayne Dixon there. Time now though for me to head on to my next stop on the Tolkien Trail, wherever that may be. Another trip to somewhere that's world renowned as a seat of learning and a place that saw the future author spend the majority of his days.
In 1911, J.R.R. Tolkien left school in Birmingham, spent that summer in Switzerland on a trip that many say was the inspiration for Bilbo Baggins' later adventures, and in October of that same year, enrolled here at Exeter College in the city of Oxford. Lynn Forest Hill is from the Tolkien Society. Lynn, lovely to see you. Now, I've made the journey from the Midlands here to the city of Oxford, one that Tolkien made as well. Tell me about that. He came in 1911 and just seemed to flourish when he got to Exeter College. It seemed to welcome him in and give him a sense of a place to belong and a home that he hadn't had since his mother died. It's uh, rather strange that in a wonderful environment like Oxford, it's actually earlier experiences that seem to have provided him with the majority of his um, material, his source material, one of the um, absolute influences we can say that the environment of Oxford provided. Um, on a family picnic down by the Cherwell, uh, little Michael Tolkien tripped on a, a willow root and fell into the river and his father had to wade in in his best cricket flannels apparently and fish this small boy out but of course we see the echo of that in um, the escapade where um, old man willow actually closes round Merry and Pippin. Also many an academic connection of course between Tolkien and Oxford. Let's go and investigate some of those now. So Lynn, we're at the heart of Oxford here, surrounded by its colleges, many of which have links to Tolkien as a professor, but it was as a student that he first came here, wasn't it? Studying? He was studying classics and he was already a, a gifted classic scholar and threw himself more into university life than into his studies. And when he changed his um, specialisation from classics to English language, he really flourished. He gained a first and um, his career took off from there. After graduating, he went to Leeds University. Uh, then he came back to Oxford in 1926 and he was based at Pembroke College. He was already working on The Hobbit before he came to Pembroke. He'd started that in Leeds, but he was at Pembroke during the finishing stages. Um, as it came up to publication, what he did then was to um, develop the story that became The Lord of the Rings. So there was quite a gap um, between uh, coming to Pembroke and then taking up what is probably his most famous association, which is his teaching work at Merton. His teaching at that time had a direct influence on some of the things that would later go into the Lord of the Rings. And other academic influences of a completely different kind were also to be found in an unexpected place in the city, weren't they? Because we perhaps wouldn't normally associate great literary works with a pub like the Eagle and Child. This was the um, kind of quintessential meeting place for the group known as the Inklings of which Tolkien was a founder member. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis met and realised that they shared a good deal in common in their interests in literature. So um, Tolkien would read chapters of The Lord of the Rings. Some of the chapters that we now know as the chapters in The Lord of the Rings were first read here. But taken all together in the way that they are in Tolkien's work, they become something more than the sum of the, the parts of which they're made. Lynn Forest Hill of the Tolkien Society there. And no attempt to follow in the author's footsteps would be complete without visiting Northmoor Road here in Oxford, where he lived first at number 22 and then at number 20. Here he wrote The Hobbit and most of The Lord of the Rings, and as a result a blue plaque commemorating him can now be found at number 20. It seems fitting for us to end our trail of Tolkien's Oxford in a street where he spent so many of his days writing so many of his great works. But of course, our Tolkien trail doesn't end here. So, where next? 
Well, today in the 21st century, the village of Silchester is a quiet, sleepy, rural one. But 2,000 years ago, it was a bustling Iron Age and later Roman settlement, which has provided perhaps another influence for author J.R.R. Tolkien. Professor Michael Fulford of Reading University leads the excavations, and it's here that a certain ring lay for centuries before being unearthed to become part of our story today. We've been excavating here now for, well, this is our 17th season on this particular site, and um, what we're looking at is one uh, area, sort of representative area of the town to explore its history from beginnings to end. And now that we're 17 years in, we're pretty much near the beginning of Kaleva. So we're exploring that profile of the town from the Iron Age through to the abandonment of Kaleva somewhere between the 5th and the 7th century AD. Why we chose this particular spot was because it gave us a chance to look at a sizable area. It's, it's actually less than 1% of the area within the walls, but one in which we could see both evaluate what the Victorian excavators found here, but also have a very good expectation that we'd find new things um, as we went down. And that's exactly how it's turned up. So we've got a very rich history of Kaleva uh, from Iron Age through to um, the post-Roman, the early medieval period. So that's the background on the dig here at Silchester. Um, how does the Vine Ring fit into the Silchester story? Well, over the seasons, we've, we've accumulated quite a number of, of, of rings. Um, they're either represented but simply by the, the stone, the gemstone, and the, the carving. Um, so that's come away from the actual ring. Sometimes the setting, and those settings have been both of copper alloy and of, and of iron. Um, we've had a little fragment of um, a ring of silver. Of gold rings, we have had none. We have had you know, tiny, tiny bits of gold, but um, nothing substantial like, like the vine ring. So the vine ring is really an exceptional find and the ploughman who, who, who saw it in the plough soil back in the, towards the end of the 18th century had a you know, really good eye because it's not often that you'll pick items of such value and such interest out of the plough soil. The ring stands out as an exceptional find. It's a one-off. Of course what's fascinating about it is the, the Christian uh, dedication, Vivas in Deo, but also there's a, a name, there's a, um, a, a, a nice Celtic name there, dedication to um, Senechianus. And of course that raises the whole question of is it the ring that's mentioned in the cursed tablet from Lydney, the Roman temple just the other side of the Severn in Gloucestershire. So it's kind of intriguing, isn't it? Great work being done at Silchester. And with one half of the vine ring story discovered there, no prizes for guessing where we're going to find out about next with author and historian Matthew Lyons. In the late 1920s, Tolkien was invited down to uh, an archaeological dig at, in Lydney where um, an archaeologist called Mortimer Wheeler was excavating a Roman temple. And essentially, uh, Tolkien was invited down as, as an expert in, uh, in philology and in old languages. One of the things that uh, Wheeler and, and his team excavated at um, Lydney Park was a curse tablet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, dedicated to the god Nodens, which says, Sylvanus has lost a ring, he has vowed half its value to Nodens. Among all who bear the name of Senesianus, refuse thou to grant health to exist until he bring back the ring to the temple of Nodens. What's unusual is that the ring itself has been found, and it's now uh, at that divine in uh, Basingstoke. So what would you say were the main influences on Tolkien? The association of, of a ring with, with a piece of work that Tolkien was involved in um, obviously excites the imagination. I, I, I don't think he's the sort of writer that um, took much more specific things out of his life or, or out of his experience and translated them directly into his work. They're, they're part of a, a web of associations and, and myths and, and ideas. Um, so I, I certainly think it's part of his creative uh, process, absolutely. So one of many influences that go into a, a crucible influencing an author. Matthew, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So we've come full circle and are back at the Vine where we started our Tolkien trail. From the landscape and characters of Birmingham, to the academia and languages of Oxford, to the Temple of Nodens at Lydney Park, all were aspects of Tolkien's life, there to be recalled, adapted and reimagined in the author's works if required. And with the discovery of the Vine Ring at Silchester seemingly telling the other half of the Lydney Curse Tablet story, 
The question remains, is this the ring that inspired author J.R.R. Tolkien? Only you can decide. But, well, I know what I think. Bye-bye. <laughs>